uh, about 10 of you had um, already added in the jointermagen.com. Oh, 11 now, great. Yeah, I found the right number. And there it is. It's in the syllabus too. I revised the syllabus to have the right number in it. So yeah, join that. Because that's the only way you can turn in the guiding questions. So I don't know if you've clicked on the guiding questions yet. So there is an assignment here in Google Classroom. Let's make this larger. Um, so what would be your natural temptation is to, whoa, why is there some space there? Okay, what we need to do is, uh, even though the assignment is posted in Google Classroom, you need to turn it in on turnitin.com, okay? But I did post the um, questions here. You won't find the questions in turnitin.com, you find them here. So cut and paste them, put them in a Google Doc, and then submit that Google Doc at turnitin.com. Again, you don't have to write more than 50 words. I'm sure many of you will do it anyway, just because some of these questions are so vague that you could say a vague answer and it wouldn't really say anything. And I'd mark you down for that. You need to get as specific as you can as quickly as you can. Um, 50 words for each question? Yes. Um, so for this particular assignment, it'll be about 200 words minimum. And yeah, however many questions there are, it's five points for that. So on the chapter where there's eight questions, it'll be 40 points. This one is 20 points. So today, we'll definitely be talking about government and its purpose and uh, different classifications, uh, ways we uh, analyze government. Um, well, yeah, I guess. We won't be analyzing government too much, but it's ways of looking at differences between countries. So all of that is not due till next week, but don't put it off till next week. And just like last year, right, uh, you would always ask me, when's the DBQ due? And I would always say 11.59 and 59 seconds. Same thing. It'll serve you better to do it sooner, but you can get it to me the day it's due, even if you want to stay up till midnight. Um, okay, first thing I want to do. Yes. I think I want, did I go over enough of the syllabus for you yesterday? I think this is like the one class where I actually got through it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Anytime you have a question, just scream at me. Well, don't scream. Raise your hand, I'll answer your questions. What I want to do first thing today is um, this government in my life assignment, which I just posted about a half hour ago. Just take a look at it. What you can do is just uh, create your own Google Doc, title it Government in My Life, and you're going to submit it here. Because I didn't create an assignment sheet for you. you can we're gonna spend maybe five minutes together just starting on this, and then you can work on your own or with people around you trying to figure out how the government affects your life. But I want you to do it with artifacts. Oh no, no, I don't have my wallet here. My classroom, it's in my office. Oh. Okay, well we'll have to get creative then. What I want you to do is with the stuff you have with you, uh, I want you to have things that show that the government affects your life. So for some of you who have a wallet or a purse or a backpack, this will be easier because you actually have stuff to go through. Me, I would go into my wallet and to prove that the government affects my life, I would pull out my driver's license. How many of you have driver's licenses? Cool, yeah. Can't do a lot of driving without it legally, all right? The government is in charge of regulating uh, who drives, what gets driven, all of that. And I can prove it because of the driver's license. So that's kind of the essence of what we're doing here. We want to look at how many different ways, just in your space, government affects your life. You can look around the room. Looking around the room, do you see any evidence that the government's involved in what's going on here? might have to think or extrapolate. Are there things here that wouldn't happen without government? Yes? Time? The clock? What about the clock that the government control? You're right, there are ways that it's affected. I put that down. Anyone want to help her out? Yeah? 
new fire extinguisher. Yeah, I noticed, like, you know that sign that's on the wall? Like, I know you can't see it very well, but there's actually arrows drawn on it. It's supposed to, by law, we're required to show you how you can escape the building, how you're supposed to escape to get away from the building if there is danger. That's a law. The government made us do that. And it's making you safer. I think I saw your hand too, Maury. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, daylight savings is a law, right? You know, every spring and every fall when we like have a hard time getting up because they made us change our clocks forward and back. Yeah, that's government regulated. Yeah. Each local government kind of agrees to follow that. So everyone around the world agreed that like when you fly up to um, Fiji and then to Tonga that it's gonna be like tomorrow instead of yesterday, right? You remember the international date line? No. <laughs> you didn't go. Everyone agrees to that. It's kind of an international treaty. So time zones and clocks are definitely part of that. Anyone think of anything else? Yes. Masks. Masks, yeah. Okay. I don't know how many of you choose to wear a mask, but by law we have to wear it. Yes. Good evidence. Very timely. Yes. Uh, with the like trash and recycling requirements, or no? Huh. Well, you know, we probably wouldn't have all the recycling bins and uh, even the mixed recyclable trash can unless the government were encouraging that, wanting us to do it. I don't know if we have to. Do you recycle in your house? Do you have to recycle at your house? Yeah. I mean, I know my own trash can. I live in Sunnyvale. And so they make us have, we had to swap out older trash cans for newer ones. The thing they do in Sunnyvale is they're trying to get us all to compost. So our trash, we have to get a divided trash can where there's part for trash and there's part for food waste. I don't have to put anything in the food waste. I can waste all my food, whatever I want, and throw it in the landfill side, but they make us have that part when we get trash and such. So that's, that's good. I have freedom, the government does try to regulate my life, create laws. So, but what I would like you to do is, you know, in this thing here, it says backpack, wallet, or space. If you can find stuff that you actually have with you, like in your wallet or in your purse, I would show you my library card. That's an easy one. But I actually have it. I don't know what you actually have and how government might affect you. So I want you to think about that personally. So I'm going to shut up for a while here, give you time to type out your list. So. Come up with your 10 things, and then explain how the government is involved in that thing that affects your life. Even money itself affects your life. If, do you guys still carry cash? I guess you're not. Do you guys have, do you guys leave, use ATM or electronic payment a lot? My daughter got a bank account, and she worked a little this summer. I paid her. And so she's like totally into electronic payment now. I tell her, be careful. It's really easy to wave a piece of plastic and your money just disappears. Better if you have like actual bills because then you're slower to shell it out. But anyway, that's, yes. Money is printed by the government. So if you have cash in your bag, you can put that down. And if you want to talk it out with people because you're running out, you only have seven on your list, go ahead and talk. It'll give you five or 10 minutes, depending on how long it's taking you.
check the sound quality. Okay.
starting notes in a few minutes. Uh, try to finish up. If you're done and you want to take a little walk and get water or do something, wake up, go ahead. We'll start in a few minutes. Okay, I'm going to move over to the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, I'm only going to get through half of the day. We'll see how far we get. So again, when you're taking notes, you don't have to write down everything I say. The slides are already posted for you. Uh, just write down what might you feel like is important. If I think it's important, I'll tell you. <laughs> write it all down, okay? So like, for example, when we get to uh, the purpose of government, and I say the preamble of the Constitution, clearly here, you just need to know those six things that are underlined that are important. So don't feel like you have to write down the whole thing. Okay? Don't take pictures of the slides. You know, it's all there for you. Just, uh, if there's something you're not sure about, raise your hand. I'll help guide you.
We will do a quiz over this eventually. So you will need to know the key stuff from each slide. Um, if you, so I, I gave the speech to the other class, but I'll do it for you. So some people learn best by taking the notes immediately. Some people learn by like listening to it. And then you go back through the slides and remember what I said was important. You can write it down later. Um, you really have to figure out what works for you. Some people will sit in a college lecture. You're going to be in college lecture hall next year, you know, maybe 200 people in a room. But the teacher's not going to slow down and help you individually in the middle of that. You have to figure out how you're going to digest what's coming at you. So experiment a little bit. If writing everything down as fast as you can is not working for you, <laughs> try, try something different, please. Um, I would always do that and I could catch it. And it helped me to write it down. And I knew, I, I had the ability to like self-edit while I was going through. So I could shorten what I was hearing. Because I, I went to college in the era before there was PowerPoints. So I had nothing but what the guy was saying to me. So you're in a different era with PowerPoints. Most college lecturers are gonna do that. And if you're lucky, they'll post it for you. If you're unlucky, you just gotta kind of catch it. And then some professors will talk for a long time, and whatever they talk about, or whatever is on the slide, is not necessarily what's on the quiz. That's bad news. Uh, you'll have to learn to cope with that too. Of course, you all know because you've taken my class, that's not me. If it's on there, it's going to be important. I don't know. But you want to learn to shorten it down at speed. So let's move through the first slide. Um, Government has such a big effect on your life. So much of what we can do is regulated. Uh, in other words, it's guided by rules that government creates. But what you have to realize is that government is not separate from you. Government is an institution of society. Okay? So we live in a society um, let's use an example here. We, our school is in Mountain View. The society in Mountain View, uh, which has about 90,000 people, has its own government. So Mountain View has decided, in order for things to run smoothly in this little area of Mountain View, we're going to decide to have a mayor and a city council. Okay? They could have decided we're just going to have a dictator of Mountain View. They didn't have to decide to have all this voting and stuff. They could say, we're going to have a king of Mountain View. And we're just going to have it so we don't have to keep voting all the time. It's a waste of time. We want someone in charge. Each society decides how to put what system to put in place. How many people should it have? Um, there are some cities that have a lot more um, councilmen or supervisors. They have different rules for how um, how long that person can be in office. Um, you have different rules for how to choose the police officers. Okay? All of those rules about how that city runs, whether it's Mountain View or your hometown, I'm from Sunnyvale, I have a city manager, uh, about the same number of city council people. It's a little different. Okay? But each city has that power to do it. And uh, in our American democracy, which most cities are built off of. Um, even though you have government which has power, it's government which we give power to. Okay? The, the government isn't apart from you. It's established by you to do certain things. So this might be foreign to your experience because you're still at home. <laughs> but when you're out on your own, maybe you'll have roommates, college roommates. Okay, next year you're going to be living with someone who's not your mom and dad. And so they can't tell you what to do and you can't tell them what to do because <laughs> you're roommates. How much power do you have? But you might decide as a society of two, three, hopefully not four people in your room. I don't know what your dorm will be like or if you're going to rent a house with someone. Students share a house sometimes, you know, you have worse than Big Brother, you know, eight people in the house, <laughs> can't vote anyone out, you're stuck with them. Um, however you're going to do it, you're going to want to divide up the chores. 
And you need to come to a mutual decision about that. So within the group, you're gonna have to decide who decides. Do we all decide? Or like, um, this person clearly has the type A personality and the rest of us are just sheep. We're gonna let uh, him decide or her decide. But that is a group decision of all the members of the house as equals. In your situation now, who tells you what to do around the house? Is it your mom or your dad? You're all answering in your head. It's okay, you don't have to say out loud. Right? You don't have quite as much power. Because however that got established between your mom or your dad, I don't know if you're in a single parent home or if grandma and grandpa live, you know, there's a there's a different dynamic in each house about how it runs. Maybe you have like five brothers and sisters, but somehow the oldest brother or sister is not the one who like is the bossy one. Some other person in the hierarchy establishes what you do. Like, oh, grandma's here, but no, it's auntie so-and-so who's really in charge when we have Thanksgiving. It's not even her house, but somehow she's in charge of things. Every society works out its own rules and relationships. Family's weird because we have age and you know mom and dad. Who's paying the bills? But in a wider society, government is what we all agree on should help run things. Can you imagine if in the United States with 300 and how many? 330 million people, I think. We had to argue. 330 million people had to argue about every little thing. What a mess that would be, right? I mean, I can barely decide what to have for dinner when there's four people in the car. <laughs> Can't agree on anything. How are we gonna agree on anything in the country with 330 million people all have a say? Well, maybe not the babies. You know, but I mean, someone has to decide where's the cutoff. No, I'm sorry, you're 17 and a half, you don't get a say. Who decided that? Society. Society said, here, government, you decide what the rules will be. So some group, in this case, probably, um, yeah, Congress. So you have 100 senators and 435 people in the House of Representatives, and then a president who signs off on it. They all said, well, we're going to make the voting age 18 by law. Everyone who's 18 years old has to be able to vote. They're the ones who drew the line. But we told them, we give them permission to draw that line. Oh, and I left out. 35 states had to ratify that. It's the 20, 26th Amendment? My, okay, pause for family history. So my brother-in-law is kind of weird. Like they're homeschooling my niece. He's not weird, he's cool weird. For some reason, they've obsessed on the notion that they need to teach their daughter all 27 amendments to the Constitution. And geography, like she knows the world map and where the capitals are, so they're very proud of this, it's great. But she, my niece, eight years old, buck teeth, she knows the Constitution amendments better than I do. I couldn't tell you that number 25 or 24. Bam, bam, bam. Embarrassing. All right, have you seen this list before? Should be familiar to you from whatever social studies classes you've had. These labels, these adjectives describe the different powers of government. So our particular brand of government has actually separated these powers into branches of government, which we'll talk about later. But sometimes the powers aren't necessarily separated out, okay? If I'm evil Emperor Palpatine of the Galactic Empire, who's returning from the dead in, uh, what's the name of that last movie? Yeah. He's on planet Exegol, I don't remember the name of the last movie. Doesn't matter, Star Wars doesn't matter. Okay, if I'm the evil emperor and the first order, the last order, whatever they call it, it's taken over, I have all of these powers. I make the loss, I enforce them with my uh, lightning, whatever they call it, force lightning, yeah, psh, you know, do it. And if you say, but I was following the rules, I could say, no, you didn't, psh, okay? Because I get to interpret the laws I created. It's all me if I'm the evil emperor. And there are government forms where all of the basic types of power are contained in one person. That would be a dictatorship. But then you have to consider, right? But that evil emperor 
is ruling over a society, right? How can one person rule over however many trillion people are in the Galactic Empire? That doesn't make any sense. When it comes down to it, uh, it's amazing that I'm able to control 11 people who don't want to be here necessarily because you all would rather sleep or drive home. Somehow you are giving me power to have over you. Okay? Or you're afraid of some other force possibly. Okay? Oh, they're going to fail me. Oh, I don't want a high school uh, diploma. Oh, I won't get into the college I want. Oh, my mom will kill me if she finds out I left the school. Okay? So there are all these power structures that might be in place. But I don't have power over you. I only have the power to keep you in this room that you're giving me. Uh, you're giving power to your mom to control you. You didn't want to be in school. What she going to do, Cherry, chain you to the desk and make you pass the test? You're choosing to let her manipulate you into passing high school. Or maybe you have self-motivation. I don't want to, I don't want to make school sound like prison, but okay. you have a choice. Society chooses what kind of government it's going to have. They're going to let the evil emperor rule, that's fine. Let him blow up a few planets, okay, we have a Sith Empire. But you know, at the end of that movie, am I talking about a movie you haven't seen? Probably half of you haven't seen. You know, at the end of the movie, all these people show up in their spaceships, and they go, yeah, no, we're here to fight with you, and they overthrow the emperor. He's dead. Sorry, I should have given you a spoiler alert. Bad on me. Um, if that sounds at all interesting to you, go watch Disney. <laughs> Streaming on Disney. If you have no homework tonight, that is. Okay, so... There are different kinds of governments. We have many familiar labels to them. Here's just a few of them. We'll talk more about these. You don't have to define them here, but I'm gonna define them anyway. It'll come back around. We will talk about it. So it's kind of on a continuum, right? Think of this as like a, a spectrum or a rainbow, you know, Roy G. Bibb, you know, um, spectrum. On one hand, you have uh, government types in which the people have the power to a great extent. We call this democracy. Okay. In the car, when you're driving home from school, and the person at the wheel of the car says, what should we have for dinner? And everyone has an equal vote in what you're gonna do for dinner. And it's only resolved through a vote of everyone. That's a democracy. But if the person driving the car doesn't ask you what do you want for dinner, but just drives there and gets it and no one can stop them and you have to eat that, I don't know, what's the worst dinner you could buy in a drive-thru? What? Taco Bell. Taco Bell, I agree with you. I mean, it's a go-to, but you know, any taco event is better than the best Taco Bell. Period. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. That's a dictatorship if you have absolutely no say. When you were three, you probably had absolutely no say. And if you had power when you were three, it was only because your parents gave you that power. Stop screaming, stop screaming, okay, we'll get ice cream. Oh, good for you, if you're three years old, you can scream and get what you want. Good on you, but your parents gave you that power. It's a dictatorship of a three-year-old, oh. Worse than evil Emperor Palpatine. But that you get it, right? In the middle, we have different levels of control. So in a monarchy, which is closer to dictatorship, um, generally a family has control. These were put in place a long time ago, mostly to prevent a lot of wars and civil wars. And they hadn't even heard or thought of elections yet. It's like how do we move from one guy with the army to the next guy with the army without everyone dying? Because <laughs> they'll just fight with each other and kill us and make us join their army and die. Well, they said, instead of all the fighting, let's just have this family pass power and have control. Then we'll respect them, we might even deify them. Hail Pharaoh Ramses, you know, that kind of stuff. But the family is in charge and it prevents fighting and the society agrees. That's monarchy. Um, what developed around 600 years ago, plus or minus 100 years, is the form of a republic. Rome had one and failed, and then they tried again around uh, England and France. 
French and English Revolution Civil War. A republic is where the people choose the leaders. So if you're riding home in the car and no one knows what they should have for dinner that night, but no one really wants to fight over it, you just say, okay, how many think that Mari should choose what we have for dinner tonight? And everyone says, okay, Mari decides. That's a republic. Because the group, the democracy, has actually chosen the leader who will make the decision. And that's what we live in. Okay. We as a group decided, okay, Biden's going to lead, not Trump. And maybe it wasn't a 100% vote, right? Half the people, a little less than half, didn't like it. But we still follow that leader because it was done by vote. That's a republic. So representatives hold the power. Not, it's not pure democracy, like all the people hold the power. This is called indirect democracy, if you want to be technical. And democracy is technically direct democracy. Everyone has the same power to make a vote. And we usually figure it out through majority rule. Like, hopefully, um, you'll get some say in some things for class decisions this year. Like your itinerary for Hawaii, hopefully Ms. Rosales will let you decide which one or two things you can do. She's giving you the power. Um, but uh, you shouldn't just give her all the power to do everything. You should ask for some power. You are the class. You are paying. You're paying for her to go to Hawaii. You should probably get some input. So try to take back power. I encourage you to do that. <laughs> She'll hate me for saying that. That's okay. <laughs> right? You are going to Hawaii, right? Let's pray that COVID cooperates. I'm encouraged. I know Hawaii really wants money and tourism, so I'm pretty sure it'll be open. The question is how long you have to quarantine, you know? Get your vaccine. It'd be easier to get it. Okay, politics. Last word. I don't think I ask about this on the quiz, but I might surprise myself. We're going to talk about the political process, but in general, politics is this. Uh, description of how the society decides how to distribute power and resources. So how do we decide that Mari should make the decision about where we go to dinner? I don't know. She made friends with people. She intimidated people. You better let me decide. You know, you owe me. I don't know. There's all kinds of uh, economic <laughs> money power, maybe uh, loyalty power that can go into this political process. It's very complicated. When you and your cousins get together at the family reunion, who kind of decides where you go hang out? Who gave that person the power? Is it because it's their house? Because it's their car? Or is there still someone with more, I don't know, whatever the influence is, that's all political. It's kind of weird. We think of it as like human dynamics, family dynamics. But in a larger sense, as far as social, if you want to put a label on that, it's political. So, so many people say, oh, I don't like politics. I don't like all this Democrat, Republican stuff. I don't want to, want to understand it. They're arguing about a bunch of stuff. Nothing gets done. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a process, which we're going to explore as we go on through the class, about how that happens. Because out of 330 million people, how do we arrive at Donald Trump and uh, Joseph Biden as our two options. Aren't there better people out of 330 million people? Couldn't we at least get someone below 80 years old, right? Sorry. That's ageism. Just giving you examples. Somehow, we've let other people or there are organizations in the society which help decide those things. You didn't decide it. You wouldn't have chosen them if you had been able to choose anyone. Probably wouldn't have chosen Kanye West either, but you know, not Trump and not Al Gore. Uh, Al, no, Joseph Biden. Why did I say Al Gore? We lost my remote. Okay. How are you guys doing? Do you want to take a water break? Are we allowed to write exactly? You're allowed to write whatever you want. Uh, 
The only reason I would grade you down is if I thought there was something I said, this is important, or I thought it was important enough because I talked about it for 10 minutes and didn't change the slide, and you didn't write a thing. Oh, all right. <laughs> like, where were you? If I talked about it that long, you must, you know, there must be something important there. You gotta put something down. You should have written something down. But how much you write and what you write for that time, that's up to you. All right, this is important. <laughs> you will need to know for the semester exam what are the characteristics of a state. So a state, uh, when we use the word in the United States, we think of it like, um, we think of it like um, California versus Nevada versus New York versus Florida. Okay. Uh, we're the United States, but technically, you know, in the world, an independent state is its own people and its own territory with its own laws and government that can do whatever it wants on its own. Given this definition, California is not a state. We're not an independent state. So Americans get confused. But an independent state is one where you can't be told what to do by people outside. So if in California we want to, um, um, yeah, I'll use the example, kind of silly, but yeah, it's legal now. Smoke marijuana. California really wants to smoke marijuana. We want to do that. But then there's someone higher up, the United States government, that still says marijuana is illegal. And they actually could come in and arrest a bunch of people if they were trading marijuana um, between state lines. California, we have marijuana. Oregon has marijuana. Uh, right? We trade the marijuana. But as soon as it goes between California and Oregon, the federal government can come in and arrest everyone involved. Because it's interstate trade. And the federal government can regulate interstate trade. Yeah, sorry. Kind of complicated. But <laughs> if what we do in California can be overridden by someone outside, then you are not an independent state. You, as children, probably still living at home, you are not independent. Because your parents can come in and tell you what to do. If they want to get really dictatorial, they can chain you to your bed and shut off the power to your room. You're stuck. <laughs> you have power over you. Um, uh, government is independent, separate, if it has all four of these characteristics. This word power is often um, if you are a diplomat or you want to learn a vocabulary word for the SATs, the word is sovereign. A sovereign state is one that has power over itself and no one else can tell them what to do. So it's also a verb, or sorry, adjective, wrong noun. Sovereign, uh, I can't spell called sovereignty. You have sovereignty if you have power over yourself. Um, I guess Britney Spears uses a different word for it. <laughs> you have confidence, uh, independence from your caretakers. Poor Britney does not have personal sovereignty over herself. But she's working on it. There's progress. Uh, frankly, Britney Spears doesn't mean that much to me, but I don't like to see anyone not in power over their own lives. It sounds like it's been pretty bad. There's an example of a parent ruling over your life far too long. All right. So um, any kind of government with power, dictatorship, uh, democracy, doesn't matter. You are a state if no one outside of your space can tell you what to do. And of course, you have to have people. You have to have some kind of society for you to be a state. Some people really want to, like, in parts of Northern California, they just don't want to pay taxes, they hate what the state government's doing, they want to form an independent state. <laughs> but they don't have control in their little county, the county of Northern California, called, called Jefferson County, and they've been wanting to secede from California for a long time. But California won't let them. The federal government doesn't want to let them be a separate country or a separate state. 
And so um, they're forced to continue to pay taxes and be part of the system. They are not sovereign. As much as they say they are and want to be, it doesn't make them so. Okay, so the only origin in the state that you need to worry about is the social contract theory. And I tried to teach this to you for the last two years. I don't know how much you remember. Essentially, it means that what I told you earlier on the first slide. Um, I only have power over you that you choose to give to me. If I say, sit up straight right now, I can't make you sit up straight right now. I could actually punish you and give you an F in this class, but I, I'm not physically able to make you sit up straight. Right? It's you. So in this theory, even if some guy has force lightning or an army to make you do something, and it, it's pretty effective because most people don't want to die or don't want to be hurt, that isn't actually what's going on. The society is giving you power. And in fact, um, as a leader, right? Because you believe that that leader is going to be better than some other alternative. Eh, I don't really care if Joe Biden's president, I don't love him, but I don't think that Trump is that good. So I'm gonna vote for Joe Biden to give him power. But it is, it only happens because you gave the power to him. If some government is bad, you can actually break the contract with that government. Okay? Uh, you guys seen Hamilton? <laughs> Maybe not. The ten years ago thing. Still very popular, but you know, the American colonies and Alexander Hamilton say, we're done with King George. Here's King George up there singing on the stage, crying about losing his colonies. But said, no, we choose to leave you. We're done. We're gonna form our own government. That's social contract theory in practice. So sometimes it's in the form of revolutions, but it can be just simply like, no, I'm not gonna sit up straight, Mr. Andres. No, you can't make anybody that can drink the water or go to the bathroom. <laughs> Even if I give you time to do it or say, go, you can still sit here and do nothing. That's what happens in the study hall. The teacher says, study, and no one does it. You have not given your power to the teacher. <laughs> so I gave you a very simplistic explanation of social contract theory. We could go in more, much more depth, but you're not at Harvard and I'm tired. Okay, do you remember what I said about this slide? The important stuff is what's underlined and numbered. There are, in fact, six purposes of government, and you will need to know it for our quiz that's coming up. So, you could probably say it another way, but most people in the United States learn it from this, because this is the first paragraph of our Constitution, and it works pretty well. It's kind of poetic. Did you all learn the song when you were in eighth grade? Schoolhouse Rock? No? I'll play it. Um, yeah, we have a 20 minute class. We can sing along tomorrow. Remind me if I forget. Just the time I've been teaching you, I got like 30 new email messages. I hate my life. <laughs> I'm so busy, I don't have time to like unsubscribe to all of them. I just keep deleting as fast as I can. But so many of them are important too. I have to actually spend time. Oh, okay. So let's go through the six. Have you typed them out a little bit? Got it down? Okay. So it'll be easier to hear. So uh, here, clearly in the preamble, you can see that the people who are doing this are the people. You know, this is social contract theory. The power is with the people, the individuals. This is a democratic statement. It's not a king doing it. It's not some few founding fathers. They create a system where all the people are gonna have a vote. Well, maybe not all. If you're black, you don't vote. If you're a woman, you don't vote. But it's better than most other countries at the time. And we're working on giving the vote to more people. It's so. For people like you who aren't 18, just can't vote. How many of you are 18? 
right. You guys should register to vote. You have citizenship and you're 18, you should register to vote. So you can kick out Governor Newsom or you can keep him in your power, you can vote. I don't know what else is on your local ballot, but that's the big one now. Do you care about Governor Newsom? You like it? Someone with an opinion. I think it kind of sucked how he went out to dinner when he was telling everyone else he should stay home and not go out to dinner. And he sure is spending a lot of money and telling us what to do. But I don't own a small business, so I don't have a very big issue. But he is in favor of giving a bunch of money to people during COVID, but that money is getting stolen in scams. So I don't like the fact that my state tax money, billions of it are going away to crooks. You should take better care of my money. But I'm not sure anyone else could do differently in this stressful time. Uh, do vote. I will show you how you can register to vote later in the class. But if you're 18 and you really want to vote, come see me. I can get you the link. You should register. As long as you do it 30 days before the election, you should be able to vote. Okay? And there's a special election I think a little over a month from now for Governor Newsom. So you can vote. Uh, you can also just look it up. Google does an amazing thing. <laughs> just go do it. You don't need me. All right, so we are the ones doing this together. Why are we doing it? There's six reasons why we are forming a government. We want a more perfect union. This is sort of the unity idea. What we want to do is work together. It's hard to work together. It really is. Because people are different. We have different goals. You want to eat at a taqueria? I want to go to Chick-fil-A. I don't know about you, Chick-fil-A, come on. No, I don't want to go to Chick-fil-A. They're racist. We're going to Popeyes. Are you kidding? Chick-fil-A sandwiches are so much better. I don't like their sauce. They have great shapes, too. Popeyes? No, I like fries. I like their fries better. You know, we have all these different opinions. How are we going to work together? It doesn't say it's going to be perfect. You can tell we're not perfect in the United States, right? Yeah. Last summer, that proved to me we're not perfect. And then January 6th, oof, not perfect at all. We're working on it, though. And we have to work together towards it, because if we're not united, we're just going to fall apart. And we'll talk about that history. You remember American history. There are 13 separate colonies, and they didn't necessarily all see eye to eye. So that's when this was written after all that mess with 13 different countries, independent states trying to be a United States. Clearly, justice, pretty clear concept. Uh, we don't want people breaking the rules and taking what's mine. Uh, in the Declaration of Independence, called Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of Happiness. Uh, John Locke called Pursuit of Happiness property. Right? No one should be able to come into my lunchbox and take my uh, Flaming Hot Cheetos out when I didn't tell them they can. That's unjust. So we want someone to back that up and make it happen. Police can do that. Judges can do that. I want them to do that. What I don't want them to do is um, come into my house and shoot me. Or pull me over without identifying that I'm actually the criminal and like arresting me and scaring me to death like happens so much in our country. So there's, we need the power to do justice, but we need them to be just also, right? We need them to be fair and following the rules. We'll talk a lot about Bill of Rights and rules. It's sad. It's the best part of the class, but it's at the end. So we'll get there in November. Domestic tranquility. Domestic means within the country. Um, tranquility is peace. Keep the peace. between the colonies or the states, we want there to be peace. We're not there, but you know, to ensure that is sort of to like at least create conditions where people can get along and be at peace together. Provide for the common defense. So it's kind of in contrast to domestic, because clearly there's people outside of us, outside of our domestic United States, who don't necessarily care for us. So this is take care of peace inside, and this is to protect it from attack from the outside. Okay. That's why we have an army, why we have FEMA. Any threats to the peace 
we want to defend against it. Even if that um, threat might be global warming, you know, weather emergencies, the hurricane that hits next, we want to defend against it. General welfare is the vaguest one. It's, uh, it's the idea that we all want to be prosperous. You know, we all want to do well, to fare, to go well. What does that mean, Mr. Andres? <laughs> it's so big. Um, like, what do most people want? You want to grow up. You want to get a job. You want to love your family, maybe even start your own family. I don't know, whatever that is. You want to find a partner. And, I don't know. I don't know if you want to have kids. So many people I talk to your age are saying, ah, kids, eh. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know. But whatever that is for you, you want it. And it has a picture of like you working or you having means to live and not be afraid. Whether it, I have a job or not, I just want that for me. Okay. So, yeah. But everyone should have that. This kind of speaks into it. If we're talking about the general population, everyone. Uh, we live in a society where not everyone has that. Those people are homeless, sleeping on the side of 280 or 101. You see the camps, right? right? They're not secure. When it's uh, rainy and wet, they're dependent. Right? They need help to be able to survive. Um, some of them choose to live that way, and they can survive, but not everyone does. Not everyone who ends up in those situations has that support. So we want everyone to have what they want. Um, our system doesn't yet give everyone everything they need to get there. We have what I call inequalities, right? People. It's not, it doesn't have to be just money. There's just inequalities in the way we treat you, the way you're valued, um, yeah. so that you have conditions so that you can be happy, be prosperous. So some people, like a Trump, he would say, that's all about jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. That's the way you get welfare. Other people say, no, it's more about equality, right? Fairness, let's create all these rules so everyone has the same um, rights. We might not give you money. Other people say socialism, let's give everyone the same. So we're still arguing about that, why we're not perfect. But I mean, we all kind of do. We don't want to be healthy and happy and cared for and loved and fed. That's OK. So we're working for that as a goal. Last. Liberty. You want as much freedom as possible in the midst of this. Don't you want to be free to like become rich? However, that is, if you win the lottery, wouldn't you like to keep, you know, the million dollars you win in the lottery? Well, the government comes and like takes forty or fifty percent of that away in taxes. They do. There's rules that do that, and then people who have that money go, wait, that's not fair. Where's my freedom to keep the money I want? No, a bunch of that's going here and there, and we're going to help the homeless guy, and we're going to pay for the guy who didn't get his vaccine because he's in the hospital, and all our money goes away. So, I mean, that's economic liberty. But then there's also, like, this rights liberty. Shouldn't I have a right to have a gun? Shouldn't I have a right to worship when I want to, who I want to, to marry who I want to, to go into whatever? If I need to go to the bathroom, why are you telling me I can't go into that bathroom? Because of some label you put on me. I have my own needs. I know what a bathroom is. I'm going to use a bathroom. Don't tell me which one I have to go into. Do you know what I'm talking about? Cool. So those are kind of, that's it. It's a really good summary. People look to this. Um, and it kind of encapsulates all the stuff that we are about in America. We do want to be united, but we don't want to be uniform. <laughs> I don't want to be told what to do. I want to be as free as possible while you're united. And I want prosperity for myself, freedom for myself, my own wealth. But I also am willing to give a little bit of that so we have a good union. We're still arguing over all the specifics. We've been arguing over the specifics for 250 years almost. Believe it or not, I'm glad we got through that section. Sometimes I talk forever. Did it feel like forever? I hope not. I hope not. All right.
This is where it gets a little more technical. But we should be able to get through this in the time that's left. Let's talk about different forms of government. So on the next three slides, or four slides, you will see each of these gone in depth and in detail. But before we start, just to say what the classifications of government are, you can classify a government by who is participating, right? We already talked about democracy or dictatorship. Is it everyone or is it one person? You can classify a government by where the power is within the country. Is it all in one place? Is everything ruled from Coruscant? Or do you have like senators and uh, elections on all the different planets across the galaxy and the old republic? Sorry, it's so much Star Wars. I'll think of other examples. And then third, this is where it gets technical. Are all the powers going to be chosen by the people, or are some of the powers going to choose other powers? This is the difference between presidential and parliamentary systems. Don't worry, if you didn't catch that, it's gonna be on the next three slides. Just so you know where we're headed. Uh, okay, so first, who can participate? Uh, this is exactly what you saw earlier, right? The spectrum. So we have a spectrum of does everyone participate, or do very few people participate? I mean, very few people have evil Sith force powers of Emperor Palpatine to be able to control everyone. I don't have the power of hypnotism or mind control to make everyone do stuff. Most dictators have a minority group around them who are able to help a leader of that minority group keep control. If I'm Adolf Hitler, I have a bunch of guys in brown shirts and machine guns who like intimidate everyone else in Germany to follow me. He has thousands of people with him. They are part of that dictatorship. Dictatorship is a rule by any minority over a majority. And that majority can be happy with the dictator and it can be sad, but most of the decisions are made by a minority. If your mom decides what you're having for dinner every night, you are in a, a culinary dictatorship. You can tell your mom that tonight and see if she appreciates what you're learning in school or hates it. Do you like that your mom decides what you're having for dinner? I miss those days. I have to think about everything that happens in my house. I don't want that. I would like to sit back and have someone else worry about it. Enjoy these days. When you're in college, you will have the option of sitting back and letting someone else worry about it, but you'll hate what they serve in the cafeteria. <laughs> you'll have to get a job, and then you'll have to go out and buy food that you really like. Taquerias get really expensive. You eat them every night. My advice is learn to cook. I wish you'd stop texting me school stuff. So did I already explain indirect democracy enough before? This is a republic. It doesn't say republic, but it's the same thing as I said before. On the other spectrum where you have a majority ruling, it can be the majority makes all the decisions or it can be the majority chooses the representatives. So in the United States, we choose a president, we choose senators, we choose uh, House of Representatives members, and they make the decisions at the upper level. That's a republic. These three words here, I'm gonna define them for you. It's not gonna end up on a quiz where you have to write out the definitions of each of them. More likely, I will just have a list of characteristics and you have to choose the ones that apply. Okay, so, but it, you should know the definition of it so that you're not going, oh, I forgot what autocracy means. I'm gonna go over it. There, um, now your adjectives generally describe how a dictatorship or rule of a minority operates. Uh, to keep control, most dictatorships are autocratic. They will tell you the limits. There's very little freedom. Or the freedom that you're given is not such that would threaten the power of the state. Okay? 
In Russia, I doubt more President Putin, whether President Putin cares what kind of shoes are sold. Adidas, Nike, no problem, you can sell your shoes because it keeps my Russian people happy and that's what I want, I want them happy. But they're not gonna threaten his power. If Nike or Adidas started throwing advertising around that said uh, uh, homosexuality is great and that's not what his government wanted them to think, he'd probably shut down their advertising as quickly as possible. No freedom of speech, no freedom of advertising. Because it's all about maintaining people happy and controlled under his direction. Right, I'm calling out Russia, sorry Russia. It's the apple that came to my head. So autocracy is like control over all decisions. They might not control every decision, but they could. They could. And oligarchy, it's there next to it because um, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, what example? Sure, I'll use an economic example. There's like sometimes where uh, you feel like you have choices, but you really don't. Okay, so if I want to go out to dinner tonight at a restaurant at like 10 p.m., there's very few options that are open, right? Unless I go to a supermarket to cook for myself. And a lot of those options that are open in that hour, they're like big corporations or businesses. You know, I can go to the Taco Bell or the In-N-Out Burger or you know, maybe the McDonald's. They're open. I don't know when they close. Do you know when McDonald's closes? Do they ever close? <laughs> Denny's? Denny's is open all the time, usually. But these are just a few restaurants, and they kind of set prices. You know, they're competing with each other, but they can all decide, hey, we're just all going to charge the same amount, or we're going to serve the same quality of food. Because like everyone who's awake at this hour, they don't have that many choices. It's really easy for us to control stuff. And oligarchy is more like economic control. Sometimes we talk about oligarchs who are heads of uh, segments of the economy. They use that word in Russia. But an oligarchy can also be just ruled by corporations. Right? When you walk through the airport and you're trying to decide what to eat, well, it all costs 20 bucks. <laughs> Ridiculous. And it's all kind of the same stuff. Sometimes they even don't even disguise it. You go in the Great Mall in the food court, it's like you know, like three restaurants next to each other, but it's all the same kitchen in the back. They're all like owned by the same person sometimes. <laughs> Airports are similar too. Or, um, yeah, I live in Sunnyvale. So over near Homestead High School, there's this uh, KFC that's linked to the uh, Taco Bell. They're in the same building and they sell stuff right next to each other. Because it's the same corporation that owns it. And your meal is gonna cost about the same. Whether you get the three piece chicken or the, you know, the meal deal at Taco Bell, you're gonna pay 10, nine or 10 bucks for your meal and your soda. It's all set up, they're gonna get your money Anyway, your options are limited, so they feel like they're wise. Authoritarian. There's some authority figure who is telling you what to do. Usually, a fig it could be a figurehead. More often, though, they're actually the person pulling the strings. Uh, Donald Trump was more authoritarian than we're used to in American government. But yeah, presidents have a lot of power to do what they want and order things to happen. Uh, it is pretty authoritarian within the executive branch. We'll learn about that in a month. Uh, militaristic. It is what it sounds like. Most dictatorships and minorities that hold power do so because they have the threat of military force with them. Police can be part of that. They're, they're controlled by the government. Um, but uh, definitely this is armed forces. The example that comes to mind is uh, Burma, Myanmar. There's this Asian country next to India and Thailand where the military took over the government and arrested all the, the democratically elected leaders and put them in jail. They're on trial now. This woman who was president of Burma, of Myanmar, she won the Nobel Prize, she became president, and now they just arrested her and threw her in jail, even though she had been elected. The majority voted one way in the election, and the military didn't like it, they just took over. And they're maintaining control of the country and say, we're gonna control the country for two more years until we decide we're ready for an election. 
it's all through military force. And so there's a bunch of people trying to channel, uh, what's that girl's name? Katniss from uh, Hunger Games? And they're all throwing the, the peace sign. That's their uh, resistance sign. Okay, so we have a span of different kinds of governments that are classified by how many people participate. In general, it's either more democratic or it's more authoritarian, more dictatorship. When you classify according to geography, it falls to where the power is. There are many countries where all the power is held in a central capital. The United States has a central capital for the country. It's Washington, D.C. Mexico has a federal district centered around Mexico City. But all the decisions in the country are not made in Washington, D.C. or in Mexico City, right? Because they have other elections in other parts of Mexico, other parts of the United States. So those are not unitary governments here and in Mexico. Those are what we call federal governments, where power is divided between local elections and state elections. And actually, their laws can conflict. Countries that have unitary governments, um, they're places like England, France, um, I'm not sure about Japan. Most countries on Earth are actually unitary. And they might look like they're federal, but they're not. So, uh, use an example, yeah. So we'll, we'll use France. Uh, France has a lot of territories around the world. They control Tahiti, French Polynesia. Uh, they control French Guiana. They control some islands in the Caribbean. And they actually let those people on those islands vote for local governors and local laws, because it makes sense. You're, you're, not Fran you're not in mainland France. You do your own thing where you are. But if people in Tahiti vote something that the people in Paris and France don't like, the people in France can say, oh, no, we decide you can't do that. We'll take it away. Sorry. Um, current events example. That's kind of what's happening in Hong Kong. Hong Kong used to be a British colony that was leased by Britain. And it's reverted back to China. But when China took it over, Britain said, well, look, we'll give it back to you, but we'd really like you to let Hong Kong and the people who are under our empire still have some freedom and right to vote. And China said, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And now what they're doing is, because China is the sovereign power over Hong Kong, even though they have local laws that say we can vote and we can have freedom of speech, China is chipping away at it through authoritarianism and threat of arrest so that Hong Kong people are now losing a lot of their rights. Because the central government in Beijing, the Communist Party, is just taking away all the power that had been given to Hong Kong. We're a federal government because we have different jurisdictions which can make their own laws and the federal government can actually go in and change it. Can't change it. California has its own constitution. It has its own laws. Uh, if there's a conflict between California and federal laws, it's solved through the court system. But in the federal constitution, it actually says that the federal government cannot make laws about this, that, and that. Again, we'll talk about it next month. I'll teach it to you. Or else I would tell you now. So there's actual limits. Uh, I'll use the marijuana example again. So California can legalize marijuana, and we can do whatever we want within, with marijuana within California. But the minute we cross that line where we take our marijuana outside of California by trading it or making an agreement with another state or country, the federal government can come in and say, no, we're arresting all of you because you broke our rule. Because our rule says we're in charge of interstate trade. In, Intra-state trade within California, we're free to do. There aren't very many confederacies in the modern era with millions and millions of people, population, they tend to fall apart. The most famous confederacy is the one we learned about in the American Civil War. In this system, you do have a national government, but it doesn't really have power to make the states do things. 
Um, in American history class, when we learned about the articles, articles of the Confederation, that's another example where they didn't hang together and the country almost fell apart. It, you need a stronger federal constitution to happen. But that's next week. That's next chapter. Okay. So that's the difference. We live in a federal government. Your wallet has federal reserve notes. They're issued by a national government. The Constitution actually says the national government makes the money, not the states. But the states have freedom to do all kinds of stuff like we're going to have marijuana or not. How are we going to make a law for who goes to school when? We're going to mandate vaccines. All those decisions are the state, not the federal government. You're doing pretty well considering this is a block period. Good job, guys. Keep getting good sleep at night. That way you'll be able to stay awake to the long, long haul. The last classification of government has to do with who decides on the executive power. In many democracies where people do vote, we vote for representatives, right? Those representatives in many countries actually choose the chief executive. We don't do that here. We actually vote for a Trump or a um, Biden. But in many countries, you vote for your local um, Democrat or Republican, your uh, conservative or liberal if you're in Britain. And then all those representatives from all around the country come together and they form majorities and those representatives then choose someone to be their prime minister. That's the difference between a president of the United States and a prime minister of England or prime minister of uh, Japan because of their system of choosing the executive. So I got lazy and I ran out of space, so I put L and E for legislative and executive, but that's what those mean. In the United States, we choose the executive separate from choosing the representatives. We choose representatives for the legislature, senators and congressmen, um, to make laws. But we separately choose an executive to enforce the laws, to uh, issue executive orders to form foreign, uh, decide foreign policy decisions. Now, in most of these systems, it's um, <laughs> I would say, in the United States, we like having an independent executive because uh, we've seen that person as someone who can actually. Um, protect our interests. Sometimes, you, you know how it is, you're friends with someone, but when they get with a bigger group, they change. Like, I like this guy. But then when he gets into Washington, D.C., he does a whole different thing. I don't really like that. So what I want is someone who's else who can maybe keep my guy who I elected on track. I have another friend. So two of us friends can like talk to them and we can still be cool in our social circle. That's kind of what presidents do. We have two people in Washington, D.C. who are accountable to me, who will work together for my interests. Right. Unfortunately, the executive and the legislative branches can block each other. We'll learn about the checks and balances. So this system can be more difficult to change. You can have impasses where Congress doesn't want to do it, and the president, the Congress does want to do it, the president doesn't, and nothing gets done. In a parliamentary system, it's very easy to get rid of the leader if you don't like him. The majority party gets to remove the prime minister at will. So, yeah, I don't have any current examples. I do, but you probably don't follow Israeli politics, so I'm gonna go there. My world history class, they're coming in soon. Okay, so in a parliamentary government, you don't have to wait around four years. If you don't like the prime minister, the parliament can just say, uh, we would call for a vote of no confidence because we don't think this guy is fit to lead anymore. So you can have an election within a month and they can remove the prime minister. You can have a prime minister every month. So that is pretty efficient, but it can also be more disruptive. You don't have long periods of time 
where a prime minister can do his thing, his or her thing, and get things done. Sometimes, you know, it takes time for leadership to kind of uh, establish a trend, a direction, to get buy-in. So that can be much more difficult than parliamentary government. There are many prime ministers, though, who sit in power for 10 years. Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel has been in power for over 10 years, it's amazing. Survived separate elections, survived no confidence votes, because his party keeps voting for him. He stayed in power. So it, yeah. it should be easier to get rid of him, but sometimes it's not. You had a question. Um, I think it was like they don't have like a set term. Like they do, in their constitutions, if they have a constitution. Usually it will say a certain number of years you have to have an election. But if they're that popular and their party is behind them, when you do that election, all of your legislative representatives will get elected again and they'll just choose you again. Hey, that's all I want to talk about today, and you're all brain dead. Uh, tomorrow I'll give you a little group activity assignment that was easy to do.